This week's uh, parsha is Parsha's Vayishlach. I want to uh, see if we can develop an idea. I think it is probably one of the most difficult things for us, one of the focuses to, in, in all our relationships, I think it's, it's something that uh, I'd like to bring to the forefront, not necessarily have solutions on it, but just create a sensitivity towards it and show how we don't even realize sometimes that we do it, but the negative impact that it could have. The Parsha begins with Yaakov Avinu returning from the house of Lavan, and he has to enter into Eretz Yisrael. He takes the path. Why he takes that path, it's not for now, but he goes through Eretz Seir, could have really avoided it, gone around it, but he decides to go through it, Seir, which creates an inevitable confrontation with his brother that has sworn to kill him, his brother Esav. And the first part of the parasha deals with the confrontation and how Yaakov Avinu prepares for that confrontation. It's interesting to note that Nachmanides, the Ramban, looking at the Torah as more than just a recount of history, as we've spoken about many times, sees in this confrontation, in his words, this teaches us as Jews how we are supposed to deal with our subjugation to the non-Jews until the coming of Mashiach. So he analyzes every aspect how Yaakov prepared himself, how he spoke to Esau, is really, and in fact, he brings the Medrash, the Medrash brings down that Rabbeinu HaKadosh, Rebbe, when he would have to go and have an audience with the Roman Caesar, he would learn the Parsha of Yaakov meeting Esau. It's like, yeah, because this, is the, this is the message for us as Jews, how we're supposed to be dealing with the Gentile world. It's fascinating, but... Although they were friends. Yeah. Rabbi Nathalie. Yeah, within limits, correct. Um, so Yaakov, uh, the Pasuk says that Yaakov sends Malachim, angels, to scout out and go and meet Esau. And they come back with a message. The angels return to Yaakov saying, We have come to your brother, to Esau, and he's heading towards you with 400 men. And Rashi explains that your, your brother Esau, he's still Esau, he is, he's on a war path, he's coming to decimate you, 400 people. Pasuk then says that Vayira Yaakov Ma'od, Yaakov was very afraid, Vayitzer lo, and he was distressed. And he divided up the machane, the flocks, the cattle, the camels, into two camps and split them up and said, basically, if one is decimated, there will always be another part that will survive. Again, having tremendous cosmic implications that whenever Jews are being decimated in one area, there's always going to be another area that Jews will be able to still survive. But nevertheless, what's he, being, what's he afraid about? Right? God said he's going to protect him. So I'll say he was afraid that the 20 years that he was at, under the influences of Lavan, maybe he'd lost some of that protection from God. So Rashi brings down, He was afraid that maybe he would be killed in this confrontation. But Rashi's bothered. It says a double, double lotion. It says, that he was afraid and he was distressed. So what is he stressing over? So Rashi says, he was afraid that he might be killed and he was distressed that he might have to kill others. So we've spoken about the, in the past that who are the others? Simply it would be, be Esau or the people coming to attack him. So the question all the commentaries ask 
What, what are you distressed about? There's a halacha in the Torah that uh, if somebody is coming to kill you, you have a right, in fact, you have an obligation to defend yourself, even if it means that you have to kill someone else. So what's he stressing over? I want to be he's stressed that he might get killed. I understand he's afraid of that. But to say that he's distressed that he might have to kill someone else, to protect yourself, you're allowed to protect yourself. So before I give different commentaries and different explanations, in the past, I've explained this uh, with the, uh, the, the famous quote from Golda Meir. If you remember, the, Golda Meir said that uh, we can forgive the Arabs for killing our children. We can't forgive them for turning our children into killers. Yeah. That's uh, Golda Meir. So meaning, <clears throat> okay, you have a right to kill someone. But the fact that anytime you take someone's life, it has a, an impact upon you as a human being you still stress over that. It doesn't mean that you don't stress. The fact you're allowed to do something doesn't mean it's not something you don't stress over. That's, we've, we've taken that path, explained that in the path, in, in, that, in that interpretation. However, there's a fascinating medrash here. And we always see if we get, get an insight to it. The medrash says, what was he stressing over? That he might kill his brother and his father will curse him. He might kill his brother, he might have to kill Esau, and Yitzchak Avinu will curse him. Which, at face value, that makes no sense whatsoever. If, in fact, he has a right, because Abal Ahor Gashchem Go, then what right does Yitzchak have to curse him? If he doesn't have a right to kill him, then he shouldn't be killing him. So obviously he's defending himself as a right. So was he afraid his father's going to kill, curse him? I mean, just what, what the shot in, and the Mepharshim, they were showing him bring it to explain shot in, in, in the, what, what it means over here. By Yitzhar law, they say that he was afraid he's going to get cursed from his father. What, what does it mean? Why would he think his father would curse him? That's a, one question I want to see if we can uh, develop and get some understanding of it. Another very difficult parsha here. So Yaakov has this climactic uh, encounter with Esau, and at the last minute, Esau softens, it seems. Uh, and in fact, he wants Yaakov to join him. Yaakov does not want to join him. Uh, and Esau goes on his way to Seir. And Yaakov, having been wounded by the encounter with the Malach of Esau, it says, Vayavo Yaakov Sholem. He comes intact to uh, Shechem. And... Um, <coughs> In, in camps before the city. And he purchases a piece of property. We've talked about the importance of that purchase uh, before, the parcel of land. And he encamps there, and he, uh, he makes coinage. He creates a uh, little uh, fiefdom for himself. You know, that's, uh, and everything's going great. Fortunately, it doesn't go so great. Batetse Dina Bas Leia, Dina, the daughter of Leia, went out. Liros with no Saaritz. She went to see the fashions of the land. What are the girls in this area wearing? You see fashion. Vayar Osa Shem ben Chamor Hachivi. Shem, who was the son of Chamor, Chamor is was the, one of the Hivi, the Hittite, uh, the, the Hivite princes. So this is one of the person of royalty, sees this beautiful girl, and he took her, he lay with her, he violated her. Right? It was actual rape, statutory rape, but it was something that the Pusik implies was not consensual. 
but he becomes attached to her. And uh, he goes to his father and he says, this is the woman I want for my wife. Yaakov hears about his daughter's defilement and he contains himself until his sons arrive. They arrive and Hamor, the father of Shechem, comes and um, tries to work out a deal. He says, let's, let's figure out what we can do. We can, uh, we can join powers here. Uh, this marriage could uh, symbolize a, uh, a, a unification. We become, both will come gain from it. And uh, they come up, the brothers come up with a plan. It's interesting again, you know, uh, the brothers are pushing this, not necessarily Yaakov, needs some understanding why. But they say as you know, that in our faith, you are all uncircumcised, which is a abomination for a Jew. You all gotta get circumcised. All right. Uh, actually, the, the Talmud mentions a, uh, a in a, in a uh, when it says that one person benefits and the other one gets punished for something. It uses this as you know, he he gets to sleep with her and they all got to get circumcised. You know that's the expression that the Talmud uses. Uh, but nevertheless, they underhandedly, they, were, they plotted this, and um, they got them all circumcised, which weakens the men. And um, Shimon and Levi, the sister, Dina was from Leah, so she had, uh, Shimon and Levi were her brothers, not only paternally, but maternally as well, in, for the honor of her, the sister, they went and they massacred the entire city. Now, Maimonides, the Rambam, discusses why wasn't this murder? So he says like this, he says that in the Noahide laws, which violation of Noahide laws is execution. So stealing is one of them. And Shechem's violation of Dina was an act of stealing. So that's why he would be subject to be executed. Why was the rest of the populace subject for execution? So one, this is the Rama says, one of the requirements of these assignments of Noah is that there has to be a just court system that upholds the law. And the Rama says that they saw the fact that there was no repercussions to the act of Shechem for having violated the daughter of Yaakov that was a violation of the Zion Mitzvah Noah that they have to keep just court systems and therefore the entire population were subject to the death penalty as well. This is the Ramam says justifying therefore that what Shimon and Levi did halachically is justified. The Ramam brings down in, in the Yadat Chazaka as halacha. The Ramban disagrees with it and has different, has different interpretations. You know, the Ramban says that uh, maybe it's not a capital offense, but, but he has to have different, different explanations. But according to Maimonides and other Rishonim, they justify this. So the question is like this, two questions. Number one, we're going to learn in Parshas Vayechi, when Yaakov on his deathbed is giving out the blessings, right? The blessing he has for Shimon and Levi does not appear to be much of a blessing. Yeah. What does he say for Shimon and Levi? Hamas. 
Shimon Velevi, Achim, you are comrades. Klei Hamas Mecheroseim, your weaponry is a stolen craft. You've stolen the craft of Esav. You acted like Esav. And in your conspiracy, I don't want my soul to enter. With their congregation, I don't want to join. Your anger, Arur Apam, cursed is your anger for it murdered people like they would hamstring an ox. So Yaakov the Chora curses them for having murdered. The question is, if the Rambam is saying that they were justified in wiping out Shechem because they didn't keep the B'zai Mizbnei Noach, then how could Yaakov Avinu be giving them a curse for this? Can I ask you a question? Yeah. Yaakov knew his sons, right? Right. So when he told them what happened with their sister, didn't he know they were going to do something like that? Okay, that's a good question, meaning it seems that he was part of it. That means even more. Then why is he cursing them? Right. Okay. I think that's a... a so yeah, why? You why not expect that? There What's that? Third, there were thirteen and 13. no. But I, listen, it seems that it, you know his only complaint at the end, when he says in the actual storyline, is that now you've caused the other an- the enemies to come and attack me. Mm-hmm. Right in the actual story, it doesn't seem that he was saying oh, you guys shouldn't have done that. There's the right. after effects that got. It means it's the, there's, you, you did it in a way that it caused problems, whatever. But but you know, I I hear you. What he should could he not have known that that would be the reaction? But even so, you know, but he's cursing them, and it seems that you know, and more than that, there's a story with, we have what's called the targum shivim. What is the targum shivim? It's the, called the septuagint. What is the septuagint? Is that there is a story that when, who is it? What's his name? Um, the Greek. Uh, Yeah, the Greek, what was his name? Um, Ptolemy. King Ptolemy, when he conquered the Middle East, so he was a person that was uh, very much a, a philosopher. He, was, he wanted to understand other cultures, and he wanted to get a translation of the Torah. But he thought that the translation of the Torah, if he asked them to give it to him, it's going to be doctored. So he took 70 of the Chachamim, put each one in a separate room and ask them to translate it, knowing that if they're not together doing it, he can compare, and the miraculously, the words of Megillah, that they all had the same intent in the things that they tweaked. Some of them were actually quite uh, humorous, that Arnevis is one of the non-kosher animals, was the wife of Ptolemy. So they didn't want to write the word I never, there was her name. They, they changed that. There are certain things they changed that shouldn't cause him to be angry. But one of the things they changed is in the story of Yaakov cursing, they changed it that he cursed it for, for maiming animals, killing and maiming animals. Mm-hmm. Because they don't want to, the way it's written, that he seems to be cursing them for having murdered, they didn't leave it that way. So it means even they were said, there, there was a sensitivity there. Right. You know? So what's Takab Shat? The Ram says it was okay. The Ram says that was halachically, this was a halachic decision to punish the populace of Shechem for having violated the Zion Mitzvah Day Noah. They're getting a curse. So, basically, two main questions. One is, if Abala Horga Hashkem Horgo, there is a mitzvah, actually an obligation to defend oneself, don't let yourself be killed. Even if it means killing someone else, you have to do that. Then why is Yaakov afraid? Right? So so Raji so so the Medrash says, because he was afraid Yitzchak was gonna give him a curse. If it's halakhli, okay, what's he gonna get a curse for? And then we have later on in the parsha where Shimon and Levi according to the Rambam, of fulfilling the dictate of Zion, Mrs. Ben Noah, because the populace allowed for the violation of their sister and did not take any legal repercussions against Shechem, therefore they were subject to the death penalty, and yet Yaakov curses them for having done that. They did nothing wrong, why is he giving them a curse? 
So careful reading of the Pasuk and Rashi in Parash Vayechi, I think will open up the understanding here and give us, again, I think a very important insight into all of our relationships. Let's read again exactly what it is that the curse Yaakov is giving them. Yaakov says that I don't want to be in their conspiracy and I don't want to be with their congregation. That's referring to, Rashi says, very specific things. He doesn't want to be involved with the story of Zimri. And remember, Zimri was the one that had relations with a non-Jewish woman. That's the by Baal Peor, right? So that's he's saying I don't want to be associated. In fact, when it mentions Zimri's Yichus, it doesn't mention Yaakov's name, which is a fulfillment. I don't want my name associated with that particular act, and uh, I don't want to be involved in their uh, congregation. That's Adas Korach. Shimri, Zimri was from Shimon, and Korach was from Levi. And yeah, also by there doesn't mention Yaakov's name. Korach ben Yitzar ben it, it, it does not mention Yaakov's name there again. That's the that's the right fine. Now let's see the curse. Arur apam ki oz. Cursed is their anger, for it was very fierce. Says Rashi, Afilu b'shas tofecho, that even at the time when he's rebuking them, lo kilal ela apam, he did not curse them directly. What he cursed was their anger. He didn't say you are cursed. He says I'm cursing the fact that you were angry. What is he saying here? Do they deserve a curse? They don't deserve a curse. He says, he's cursing their anger. Let's talk to the Pshant. So I heard from Arashiva a beautiful insight here, and I think this is just something that we need to be working on ourselves. No question. The Rambam says that they were in violation of the Zion Mrs. B'nai Noach, and they needed to be punished. So what's Yaakov getting upset about? What Yaakov's getting upset about is they personalized it. It's one thing that somebody needs to get punished, but when you personalize it, they're doing it not because the motivation was not because they're violating the Zion Mitzvah B'nai Noach. What was the motivation of Shimon and Levi? Payback. Payback. They are personalizing it. They're upset because of what was done to their sister. What Yaakov Avinu is teaching us is that by having personalized it and doing it out of anger, on some level, that's considered like murder. There's times when you have to punish. There's times when it's the right thing to punish. But if it's done out of personal animosity, it's done because of another motivation driving you to do it. So in most cases, by the way, it clouds our judgment and will punish incorrectly or do it too much. But even when you do it correctly, you punish the right punishment, which we're saying is here. But the fact that they did it out of a personal anger, that on some level is considered to be, it, it, it perverts the whole act of doing something right, it's considered like you did something wrong. That's what, and, and, and I think that that is, I think it's something we deal with all the time. I mean, I see it with teachers, I see it with ourselves as parents. You know, sometimes there is reason that someone is doing something that's not the right thing to do. And we have to address it. We have to chastise. We have to punish. But very often, you know, it's like the kid that just keeps bugging you. You know, it's the kid that you just have issues with. It's like there's, there's almost a satisfaction involved, or there's a there's that personal sense of punishing. But it's more it satisfies my getting my pound of flesh, 
as opposed to recognizing that this is the right thing to do, and in the case when we deal with our children, it's the right thing to do for them. But the problem is that when it's not done with that motivation, that it's the right thing to do for them, and it's personalized, don't think that they don't pick up on it either. As us as teachers, as educators, if they sense that the punishment is being driven by my own personal agenda, then it has a whole different impact in terms of what it's supposed to do. It changes the whole act. It could be the right thing, but you're doing it in the, with, with the wrong agenda, it changes what the act is supposed to be. Arur apam ki oz. Their anger was fierce. It makes it like an act of murder. It's the right thing to do. The wrong reason perverts the entire act. And I think we have this all the time. I mean, it's like, it's so hard to be objective. But when we react to something, just having, are we reacting to it even if we know it's the right thing to do, but are we reacting to it because what's motivating us is to do the right thing? Or do we have other agendas what's motivating us to go ahead and react in the way we're reacting? It's something that we need to ask ourselves every time we are acting in a certain way. And if you're getting angry, you can almost be certain that the reason why you're reacting in the way you're reacting is not for the right reason. Kid is bothering you. I mean, you're trying to do your work, you're trying to watch TV, you're trying to, and you react to something out of anger. Okay, okay. You know, he, he shouldn't be climbing on the table, fine. But the way you're reacting to it, what's motivating, are you know, you're doing this because it's a, this, it's, it's a safety issue for him or because he's bothering you? And that's a, the personalization of something in terms of using it as a, as a the, the punitive measure to be able to satisfy my own feelings about it. And we do it all the time. We do it all the time and it has not only little impact in terms of constructive what we're trying to create, it actually has a destructive element to it as well. So I was thinking that perhaps that's shot over here as well. Yaakov Avinu has had issues with his brother Esav. He stole his brachas, <coughs> tricked him into giving the adoshim. Yitzchak hears, Yaakov kills Esav. It might be in self-defense. It might be in self-defense. However, Yaakov is afraid that maybe Yitzchak will think that there's been a personalization it's been done out of, for personal reasons. Not because it's the right thing to do, but maybe the intent was a personal one. Once it's become a personal one, he's worried he might get a curse from his father. Because again, doing something, you know, and we see he's concerned with Yitzchak about it. He himself has that sensitivity in the way he deals with his own kids. Because Yaakov turns around and curses the anger of Shimon and Levi. That's a message. He's that sensitivity. He does the same thing with his own kids with Shimon and Levi. But perhaps, what, is, what does it mean he's afraid he's going to get cursed? You're doing the right thing. You're defending yourself. If there's a perception that it might be for personal reasons, then it takes off the table that you did the right thing. It makes it into the wrong thing. And that he's worried about, that he might end up getting a curse. That's the shot over here that the Medrash thing is worried about. But I think the takeaway for us is that even if we think we're doing the right thing, we have to just be objective. Are we doing it for the right reason? Not doing it for the right reason sometimes can not only cloud our judgment, but it perverts what we're doing to being something constructive and turns it into a destructive act. Everyone have a great day. Thank you.